Hello friends, this is Dr. Palak, your analysis and mentor. So today our topic of discussion is pulse oximetry. Now you all have used this wonderful tool everywhere. You use it day in and day out. You use it to take most of uh, your ventilation and oxygen related uh, decisions for patients. But uh, often the principles behind it are not known to all. So today I've made an attempt to explain you everything that you need to know about pulse oximetry. Also I've um, uh, thrown some light on uh, how you have to pursue this topic from exam point of view as well. So a bit of introduction about pulse oximetry. It is a non-invasive method of measuring the saturation of oxygen for a patient. Now, saturation of oxygen and oxygen tension or partial pressure of oxygen are two different things. I will be discussing that in the presentation as we go. And uh, pulse oximetry is a non-invasive method and that makes it a very easy to use, user friendly and versatile equipment for a continuous and easy quick measurement of oxygen status of a patient. So let's get on with it. Let's get to the presentation. So let's start. Pulse oximetry as I just told you is a non-invasive method to record the SpO2 or the saturation oxygen saturation right now we have all used it uh, we have seen it we have seen that there is a little uh, probe right this probe that we attach to mostly the fingers of the patient when we see this little red light have you seen it it flickers right and on the opposite side is a photo detector so basically uh, we understand that its principles include something to do with light and because we know the name pulse oximetry and as you must have seen that a lot of patients who do not have a proper pulse right it's either hypovolemia or the hands are cold we often do not get a proper reading that means it has something to do with the pulse let's just understand a little bit of physiology right as we have said that we will be uh, measuring the saturation now what is saturation what is pao2 what is the difference mostly when we look at the oxygen content when you want to understand that what is the status of oxygen in a patient the whole oxygen content concept comes into place i will not be going into much detail but just understand that inside our body we have oxygen in two forms one which is bound to the hemoglobin right and the other that is dissolved in the plasma the one which is attached to the hemoglobin is the saturation is what the pulse oximeter is also measuring the one that is dissolved contributes to the oxygen tension of blood or in other words the partial pressure of o2 which we see as pao2 and to understand this to measure this we need an arterial blood gas sample which is invasive now how does this oxygenation takes place i'll explain it in um, uh, like this okay so we have blood from the alveoli oxygen diffuses into the blood and it becomes dissolved and that contributes to pao2 but we have rbcs which contain hemoglobin now if you remember one molecule of hemoglobin has four sites where it can attach oxygen the binding of these oxygen molecules happens as such that if one molecule is attached hemoglobin itself catalyzes the attachment of the next one so that the time that is taken for the first one to attach the next one is picked up faster the next one is picked up even faster and so on okay so this way hemoglobin saturation happens and once all the sites are exhausted obviously there is uh, no more uh, of oxygen can bind to it if the oxygen that is coming from the alveoli we keep on increasing it it will diffuse into the rbc and bind the hemoglobin up to a point where all the sites are saturated and after that if i add in more oxygen it will contribute to pao2 so that means there is some correlation between sao2 and pao2 and when we studied it we formed this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve as you can see it's an s shaped 
curve which means it has a vertical part and it has a horizontal part which means what so as i said as we go on increasing as we keep giving oxygen in the plasma the pao2 will increase initially that pao2 as it increases that oxygen enters the rbcs right and binds to the hemoglobin once oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin it means the saturation will increase so initially as pao2 increases saturation also increases and we get this vertical uh, part of the curve but that happens up to a point after that no matter how much i increase my pao2 once it is 100% once the, all the sites are saturated when the saturation is 100% increasing pao2 beyond that will not increase my saturation because there are no sites left right it's common sense so we get a, a horizontal part where this saturation steeps this happens somewhere around 75 to 80% okay so what does that really mean the implications of this is that somewhere around uh, okay let's just see at 100 obviously it's 100 right at 80 it is very uh, less somewhere around 95 percent of saturation the pao2 corresponds to 75 okay so if sao2 is 95 pao2 is 75 by the time it's 100 it's somewhere around 80 right below this uh, at 90 it is 60 at 90 percent of saturation pao2 is 60 mm hg so you see that this correlation tells us that it gives a gives us an idea that if we know the saturation of a patient what the partial pressure of oxygen must be so a 95 percent means 75 like so this means that it's still below 80 right and below 80 mmg we classify as hypoxemia so we have to keep this in mind that a 90 percent or more than 90 percent is not always suffice one thing more importantly we know that after 95 percent say we have even reached 100 percent more than 75 mmg of po2 what happens after it say the po2 is 100 or it is 120 or it is 140 then the saturation is always 100 percent we will never know what is happening inside the patient's body and its oxygen content beyond 75 mmg so that's one uh, drawback that if I want to know whether the patient is being uh, given more oxygen than required, I need an ABG to know uh, if I can reduce the FiO2 and tighter the ventilatory settings. At that point of time, SpO2 is not a good measure. So this is one of the drawbacks. This correlation is what uh, helps us understand the importance and this is what pulse oximetry has exploited. So just summarizing this in a little bit, uh, we have SaO2 and we have PaO2 as oxygen content of the body and SaO2 can give us some idea of PaO2 up but up to a point. So PaO2 is what makes SaO2 and when we measure it with a pulse oximeter, we get to know some things about PaO2 but that is up to a point more than 75 mmhg of pao2 is not i mean any changes after this are not picked up by saturation we won't get any information out of it but yes any drop is picked up by our saturation and um, th that's how it can help us predict any changes uh, at least the f desaturation as we say can be picked up early and we can do what is necessary for the patient and that's why it's a very useful tool now let's come to the principle now anything in anesthesia when it comes to principle has a lot of physics on it this is to be used for pulse oximetry i told you it exploits two things one is the light and other is the pulse light what physics do we use for light it's the spectrophotometry spectrophotometry is nothing but a study where um when we take an incident light and we throw it on a substance or a solution with a solute or a surface what happens to that light 
how does it behave what factors uh, uh, it uh, what factors it remind that kind of behavior all of that comes in this vector photometry of the whole branch we have these two laws the beer lambert's law is actually a part uh, made by two laws the beer's law and the lambert's law before going into this let's uh, first talk of uh, uh, let's brush up a little bit of the basics first so this is i'll show you in this one okay so this is one medium okay it imagine it contains a solution which has obviously a solute in some concentration now when a light ray when a light ray is made to fall on it the electromagnetic wave which is our light will interact with the particles of this of the solution right and then what happens is some of it is absorbed some of the light is reflected away and what is left after this and some can be scattered as well that is your transmitted wave what is left so some part of it got absorbed some part of it was reflected away and some of it passed through unchanged and that was transmitted well it's not exactly unchanged after all this treatment like reflection interference scattering and absorption the emergent beam has some different qualities as you can see here the arrow for the incident ray was lit lot thicker but arrow for the emergent ray is a lot thinner so what changes among other things what we want to focus here is the intensity right this one is brighter this one is not that bright now what factors determine this drop in the intensity of a light ray that passes through a medium that uh, we understand uh, that beer lambert's law is what explains it okay uh, beer's law states that the intensity of the transmitted light reduces exponentially as the concentration of the solute increases what does lambert's law state lambert's law states that the intensity of the transmitted light reduces exponentially as the distance traveled by the light through the solution increases what does it mean it's pretty common sense the more this incident light has to interact with these particles of the solute in a solution the more of these losses will be right the more light will be reflected the more interference more scattering more absorption will happen there are two ways by which i can increase this interaction uh, with the particles either i increase the number of particles which means i increase the concentration or i increase the distance that it has to travel for the same concentration if a light has to travel say x distance right there will be some loss but if it has to travel 2x the distance obviously it it will interact a lot more even though the concentration is the same and the loss in the intensity will be more and this relation is exponential so summarizing these two we get an equation that uh, emergent light is equal to incident light multiplied by natural log of dca where d is the distance c is the concentration and a here is the extinction coefficient now what is this extinction coefficient okay before all this i should have mentioned we we'll study all of this with one set of wavelength and solute <clears throat> so what wavelength and solute are we talking about when it comes to pulse oximetry we took two actually we took red light and uh, of the wavelength 660 nanometer and we took infrared light of the wavelength 940 nanometer and the solute that we are talking about here is the hemoglobin more precisely we have two 
we have the oxygen oxygenated hemoglobin and we have the deoxygenated hemoglobin so how do uh, these two solutes behave when they interact with these two wavelengths that is what we have exploited and we found the data and we compare it with the patient and we uh, find the value extinction coefficient plays a part because extinction coefficient is specific for a solute so you will have extinction coefficient of pulse oximeter will be specific uh, for one wavelength will be specific uh, for deoxygenated it will be specific for one wavelength and when we plot the graph we get something like this now this is a graph in which we have the wavelength here we have the extinction coefficient so ext extinction coefficient basically tells us this is an idea of how much absorption is happening okay so if something some a particular solute has a higher extinction coefficient at one wavelength it means it is absorbing that wavelength more that's what we need to understand here so so let's just see look at the graphs uh, we have to understand first only for oxygenation and reduce right so these two let's compare these two we see that at the red light spectrum the reduced hemoglobin has a higher extinction coefficient as compared to the oxygenated which means at the red light 660 nanometer we see that the deoxygenated or the reduced hemoglobin absorbs it more but at the infrared spectrum the 940 nanometer here we see that the oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs it more right a point where these two in, intersect right uh, it happens at i think 800 hmm. at this point these two solutes are absorbing this particular wavelength to the same extent so if i take a sample of blood and i expose it to 800 nanometer the absorption by both oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin will be the same the transmitted light will have the same reduction in the intensity so i will not be able to differentiate that is why we needed two wavelengths at which these two behave differently right so we found that deoxygenated hemoglobin absorbs red better and oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs infrared better so if i take a sample of blood and then i expose it to red light and see how much of it is it was absorbed and if I then throw infrared light and then I uh, uh, see what how much of it was absorbed and if I compare it I make a ratio of it I will get what the ratio of ox uh, deoxygenated or uh, better I should say reduced the reduced is it to oxygenated uh, hemoglobin right so this is the kind of plot that we get if like what what is saturation saturation is the amount of hemoglobin that is saturated with oxygen divided by the total hemoglobin that we have right so this ratio gives us the uh, extent the percentage of the oxygenated hemoglobin and which is saturation so when we plotted and we picked up the data we found here as the r to ir that means amount of red absorbed by infrared increases that means more red is absorbed the saturation is falling right at 1 it was somewhere 85 at 2 we get somewhere around 50 okay so as the absorption of red is increasing the saturation is falling this particular data is already pre-fed in the microprocessor of the saturation of the um, console of the pulse oximeter so when we uh, put patient's finger in the probe the probe picks up this i uh, is it this r to ir ratio sends it to the uh, uh, console sends it basically to this microprocessor where it compares this data with the prefed one and whatever ratio comes in it then displays it on the console as a 
percentage which we call as SpO2. So you understood that the that's why if, even if you remember this particular diagram, that's why there were lights. This light source. This light sources we have two. We have red and we have the infrared. So when these two are thrown on the tissue, whatever is transmitted out is picked up by the photo detector and that data is sent to the microprocessor and further analysis happens and comparison happens with the prefed data this was regarding the how the arterial blood absorbs red to infrared right but when we are putting a patient's finger in the probe how does a pulse oximeter know it's really arterial blood there are other things as well right there are tissues there is fat there uh, there is a nail you know how does a photo detector know or how does a pulse oximeter know that we have to minus subtract the uh, scattering and the intensity loss uh, with these tissues as well uh, uh, with the, the other th tissues how does it delete that for this photo plethysmography Okay, so thesmography is a study where the measurement of change in the volume in an organ or the whole body is noted. So whenever there is a pulse, right, your artery expands, the volume increases and plethysmograph picks this up. That's how it identifies that there is a expansion in volume means the arterial blood has come. What happens is, I'll expand this. Hmm. Each time there is a pulse, the absorption pattern changes. When there was no pulse or when there is diastole, right, the non-pulsatile tissue, even the arterial blood, the non-pulsatile arterial blood, venous, capillary blood and tissues, they have a certain absorption, okay which is this one which is denoted as the dc component and every time there is a pulse this absorption pattern changes right this whole thing happens when there is a pulse because there is expansion in the volume so if i subtract these two i will find only the absorption that is happening here due to the pulsatile arterial blood right it is this blood which has hb oxygenated and deoxygenated and it is doing something with the red in the infrared and this is the ratio that i want so i want to isolate the arterial blood and this is where plethysmography comes into play so we know what absorption pattern happens in the hole when there was pulse and when there was diastole when we subtract these two we can isolate the absorption patterns of the pulsatile arterial blood that data only that data is then uh, analyzed further the rest is deleted and uh, then then spectrometry comes into play so thesmography and spectrometry we are able to isolate the absorption patterns of um, the arterial blood so plethysmography basically isolates the pulse or the arterial blood for us and spectrometry finds out its red to infrared ratio which tells us the saturation of this arterial blood right now the microprocessor gets the data for ac plus dc components right with the help of plethysmography we isolate the ac1 and with the help of spectrometry, we find out how much of it is saturated. That's it. That's about it. And once this analysis happens, it is sent to the console for display. This display can take uh, usually uh, what the value which is displayed is usually the average or the mean of three to six previous to six seconds of previous recordings ma measurements and it is updated every 0.5 to 1 second this speed of the processor 
how fast it can analyze and display the data that's what uh, performance of a device depends on the reliability of this microprocessor and the speed and what are the algorithms now there's one more thing that happens the concept of removing the effect of ambient light so you understand that pulse oximeter is basically working on the concept of light passing through our finger isolating the arterial blood and how the arterial blood is behaving now in our finger when if there is a probe some ambient light also enters i have the red diode i have the infrared diode right so how is this del deleted we cannot be putting the patient in the dark forever right that's why we say that you should cover the finger as well if you find any interference so what is the mechanism inside the microprocessor for uh, compensating the effects of ambient light there is a sequence of exposure right the photo detector is exposed first uh first only to the red led okay only to the red light so the data that is sent to the microprocessor contains red plus ambient because see red is ambient is always on right next the red is off and only infrared is on so the data is infrared plus ambient light next both red and ambient are off and we get data of only ambient light right if i if you remember how we used to solve algebra so now that we know a if i subtract 3 from 1 i get the data that is only for red if i subtract it from the 2 as well i get the data only for the infrared so following this particular sequence helps to isolate the ambient light we are able to remove compensate for the effects and the interference by the ambient light as you saw here in that picture we had a finger we had our probe and the probe had lights leds on one side and a photo detector on the other side so here what we have exploited is the effect of the transmission right whatever light is scattered and everything and what is transmitted that transmitted light is picked up that form of pulse oximetry is the transmission type now i told you in the beginning that not that that some light of this incident light is reflected as well right if i have my photo detector here and it picks up this reflected light right and if we again plot the whole graph and we collect the data for oxygenated and reduced oxygen for this reflected light that will become the reflectance pulse oximetry obviously when that happens i don't need two sites i don't need a measuring site in between right so uh, in forehead or on the nose there is only one single surface which i need to expose and it contains both so uh, the difference between them if i have to say is that transmission pulse oximetry exploits the trans or collects the transmitted light reflectance pulse oximetry collects the reflected light and analyzes it further for transmission or pulse oximetry the measuring site is in between for reflectance it is on the one side only right your leds are on one side and photo detector is on the opposite side in transmission and for pulse oximetry they are all on the one side problem with reflectance is that uh, if there is edema or if there is other interferences uh, such as poor skin contact because if there is only one place for it to be placed like the motion artifacts all of these problems were more with reflectance that is why it is not that popular but for conditions when we do not have a measuring site uh to be put in between say we do not have any digits we do not have the pinna it's a burn patient or amputations have happened in those scenarios transmission pulse oximetry uh is not that helpful and reflectance comes into play so this is the equipment the equipment contains a probe a cable and a 
console probes can be of many sizes can be of many uh, types depending upon what sites are we exploited sites could be the most common ones are digits pinna earlobe <coughs> less common ones are forehead and least common ones include tongue cheek esophagus even and depending upon these sites we have different types of probe cable is just a cable that connects the probe to the console inside the probe we have the led lights and we have a photo detector nice <laughs> and then we have the console the console contains the microprocessor which is the most important uh, part of the whole uh, setup the console also has a display which can tell you the saturation either isolated or as a part of a multi para monitor where you see nivp and other measurement aspects as well it can show you other derived um, uh, indices one very popular one is the perfusion index i'll talk about it a bit later okay then uh it can show you the signal strength now signal signal strength indicator basically tells you about the strength of the perfusion you understand now no that if if basically the data input for a pulse oximeter is the pulse right it throws light on the pulse it Uh, measures the volume change in the pulse it measures the absorption patterns about a pulse so if there is no pulse being uh, uh, transported to the pulse oximeter there will be no reading so if when will that happen that will happen if the patient has reduced bp or the extremities are cold the patient is in shock so perfusion is also one thing that we can understand Uh, with the strength of the signal that the pulse oximeter is picking up based on that you have must have seen some orthopedicians after they do a limb surgery they often put the pulse oximeter on the digits to see if there is any you know if the cast is too tight or if there is any vascular compromise so the, this is where it is exploited then uh, one more thing that the console gives us is the pulse beep and we anesthesiologists really exploit this when we have to do multitasking a lot of times we are not really looking at the monitor we are only listening to the pulse beep beep actually coincides with the pulse right with each pulse there will be a beep and the pitch of that beep the frequency on that beep is directly proportional to the spo2 reading so if the patient is desaturating that pitch also falls and that's how even if you're not looking at the monitor we uh, pick it up very fast that the patient might be desaturating and it alerts us in time you have to see that this particular option is switched on in a monitor it often has happened that the in the settings of the monitor this was not switched on and hence even if the patient's saturation fell to 90% 85% the pitch remained the same and it seemed as if the patient is not desaturating it was only when i looked at the monitor and i saw no the patient was desaturating so i would suggest that one should not be this uh, uh, dependent on machines when it comes to clinical practice for the first 6 months of my residency i actually never really looked at the monitor i only looked at the clinical parameters to understand that i should be able to pick up something clinically before my machine tells me because machines are not as reliable there can be problems in them and we if you are completely relying on them it could jeopardize us and our practice so better to be alert on your own self and if you are uh, exploiting your machines be very well versed with such settings and uh, the principles how they work so that any troubleshooting any faulty reading you can pick up why it is happening and you can fix it in time okay so let's talk about applications of 
pulse oximetry it's a potential question in itself <clears throat> so as you all know it can be used for monitoring the oxygen saturation and uh, this can be done in a in an ot in icu in post anesthesia care unit and more importantly in patient transit and it works as an early sign of hypoxemia right then it can be used to uh, monitor or measure more importantly vasomotor tone and I'm sorry it's misprinted and it can be used to assess the volume status and fluid responsiveness of a patient how we do this i'll explain in a bit for vasomotor tone we have a derived index called the perfusion index and uh, for fluid responsiveness we use the uh, plethysmography variability index then there's another index uh, another uh, variable which is plethysmographic pulse wave amplitude and that has been used to ascertain or rule out the intravascular placement of an epidural catheter with very high sensitivity and specificity almost 100% then uh, there are many neonatal applications uh, uh, one is obviously to monitor the saturation and the oxygen status of the baby then we can also be used for screening of uh, congenital heart disease <coughs> prevention of hyperoxia if you remember in premature babies if they are <coughs> exposed to high oxygen there is something called as retinopathy of prematurity that happens and hence the guidelines say that s protein should be maintained between 85 to 93 percent more than that would be hyperoxia and uh, risk of uh, rop increases so that's uh, where it is exploited then also uh, in neonatal uh, using the uh, concept of perfusion index it can also we use to predict critical illness like if we want to predict that the child is becoming critically ill what happens is that what was noted was that during this time that like you can say that the patient is becoming critical at that point there will be peripheral vasodilation and when that happens the perfusion index increases how we'll discuss that later um, so this was used as a marker for critical illness in neonates it can be used for monitoring the peripheral circulation and for that we use the perfusion index we use the signal strength uh, uh, the uh, graph that we see if you see all the uh, if you see a proper graph with the dichrotic notch then we know that the peripheral circulation is well intact you might have seen many orthopedicians or plastic surgeons after any limb surgery they use the pulse oximeter probe to ascertain the uh, circulation of that limb it can be used for locating arteries before arterial cannulation it can be used for intrapartum fetal monitoring for fetal surgeries and for that special probes are available then uh, certain diagnostic labs such as pulmonary function test labs and sleep labs they have to assess oxygenation level under different circumstances right so there also they use pulse oximetry and it can be used in home care units for any uh, patient with, that needs uh, nursing care at home or monitoring of oxygen right so let's just discuss uh, in a little bit about the derived indices that we have first is the perfusion index now perfusion index is the ratio of the pulsatile to the non pulsatile blood flow in a capillary bed okay if you remember uh, when we read about pulse oximetry and plethysmography with each pulse the artery dilates right when it dilates its absorbance also increases i'll show you the graph again this one yes this uh this systolic part right uh, when the pulse comes 
and the absorption increases <coughs> so perfusion index uh, already the pulse oximeter is gathering this data about the increase in the area of the pulse so if uh, say we have a patient with a reduced vasomotor tone which means what that the patient's capillary bed is dilated that the patient is in a vasodilated status then this increase in the absorption or increase in the uh, area of the pulse will increase this variation will increase even further right so your pulsatile component right the pulsatile component that increases so the perfusion index will increase right so if the monitor is showing me increased perfusion index that means the patient is vasodilated or the vasomotor tone is less so what does that mean when can this happen this can happen in sepsis this can happen after anesthesia either ga or any neuraxial anesthesia this can happen after stellate ganglion block right um, this can happen in a patient with hyperdynamic circulation such as hyperthyroidism so in all these situations where we know that the patient's vasomotor tone is altered and what is the status of it can give us an idea of these conditions their perfusion index gives us a indirect measure of the vasomotor tone so uh, when i see stellate ganglion uh, block it was used uh, in anesthesia it was used as a measure of failure of anesthesia say we uh, gave a patient epidural as well as ga right so after ga i saw whatever the perfusion index was then i put an epidural dose i give the patient epidural dose if the after epidural dose the perfusion index does not increase right that means there was no vasodilation that did not occur that means my epidural did not work same was with the stellate ganglion block if after the block if i see that the perfusion index is still the same it does not increase that means my block is has failed or it's ineffective so i need to redo it so that's how perfusion index was used the next concept that we derived from it was the um, the thesmography variability index the thesmography variability index and remember everything that the pulse can tell us almost like we have <laughs> we have tried to gather all that information from a pulse oximeter as well a pulse and its volume has respiratory variations you remember right uh, remember when we used to study about sinus arrhythmia that the ins with inspiration the pulse volume reduces a bit right so this this respiratory variation it was seen that a patient that is preload dependent right or has low volume status has this respiratory variability increased right now plethysmographic variability index what it does is that it is basically the percentage of the higher amplitude the maximum amplitude and the minimum amplitude remember what we are measuring here we are measuring the amplitude of the plethysmograph basically it is uh, the maximum minus the minimum divided by the maximum amplitude into 100 so it's the percentage of the maximum amplitude so uh, if the this variability is increased that means the patient's volume status is either low or they are preload dependent what do i mean by preload dependent it means if i give this patient a fluid load right according to the frank starling law the cardiac output will increase the blood pressures will increase okay the stroke volume will increase according to this law the stroke volume will increase and the rest will follow so such a patient would be fluid responsive so a patient that on the monitor tells me that it's his or her plethysmography uh, variability index is high such patients would benefit with fluid therapy 
Now coming to the advantages, advantages are pretty simple to understand. First of all, and more importantly, that it is non-invisible. Remember all this uh, perfusion index and perfu and uh, PVI. If I have to ascertain a patient's uh, arterial blood pressure, right? I need arterial cannulation, right? And if I need to understand about the stroke volume index and all the other indices, I need. Uh, either a pulmonary cath or an arterial cath, right? So these are invasive methods. <coughs> For fluid responsiveness also we sometimes use the IVP and the arterial cannulation. All these are uh, uh, invasive methods. Perfusion index and perf uh, plethysmographic variability index, they give us a method which is non-invasive. So that's why these are being explored further and further. So one of the advantages of it, the biggest advantage is that it is non-invasive. It is accurate and its response time is fast. It gives, a, it is a continuous measurement, right? If I take an AVG, AVG just tells me at that time uh, what the arterial oxygenation status is. If I need to understand, if I want another information, I will have to take another break or at least I have to take another sample if I have an arterial line in uh, place. But uh, pulse oximetry gives us a continuous measurement. The tone modulation helps us identify hypoxemia early. We have a variety of probes so it can cover all sizes, all sorts of patients. So it is economical, it is lightweight, portable, convenient, user friendly so it becomes very uh, uh, easy to use. It is battery operated so that's an advantage. We all no, don't always need electricity and very important that there is no heating required. Right. It's not just that, there is no heating required, there is no uh, heat production in its measurement that we need to take care of, so it can be used at room temperature and without any consequences. There are certain EVG machines, we saw them during COVID, they come uh, in the form of a, <laughs> a very big satellite phone or a mobile phone. It had a screen and it had buttons and it had one place where you could place the sample. That used to get heated up sometimes and uh, <clears throat> then we had to keep it in the fridge you keep it in a cool place for a couple of hours then it used to come back to the normal temperature so all those sorts of issues are not with SPO2 coming to the disadvantages and limitations this also in itself is a question first of all is the motion artifacts say the patient is uncooperative a child patient is shivering during transport on all these uh, uh, situations since the patient's fingers or the digits or the sight uh, under monitoring is uh, moving then in that case the uh, uh, input is not uniform and so the reading keeps changing and it becomes unreliable so it doesn't compensate for the motion artifacts if a patient has poor perfusion, say the patient's extremities are cold or the patient is in shock, in such situations, obviously as the pulse to the peripheral digit or the uh, site, measuring site reduces, the perfusion, uh, the readings obviously will change. If the pulse drops, the reading will change. Say there is any pigmentation of the skin or nail polish, here I should just mention that artificial nails can also interfere but acrylic nails do not. So if you find any patient with acrylic nails, please don't ask them to remove. It's a costly affair. Okay. So acrylic nails, they work just fine. Then patients with irregular rhythms. Again, if the rhythm is irregular, the pulse is irregular, the readings is not uh, uh, uniform. And so again, the value on the monitor becomes difficult patients with AF or uh, sinus arrhythmia or heart blocks then electromagnetic interference anything that has to do with light right so ambient light and in electromagnetic interference that can alter the reading then delay in detecting I told you uh, that uh, SPO2 actually measures the past three to six seconds and uh, this is major like uh, every 0.5 to 1 second this is updated but it's an average of the last say approximately 5 seconds so there is usually a small delay this becomes important when we already can see the clinical signs of hypoxemia right so at that point we become really impatient even those 3 to 6 seconds even those 
five to seven seconds that it takes to search the pearls and give us a reading become crucial. Pro positioning and size. Although there is a lot of variety available, still in each institute there would be some available, some won't be available, and uh, it's uh, made uh, not custom fit to the patient per se, right? So any patient, say a very fatty patient, the same uh, probe, uh, the adult probe might be inadequate. Then abnormal hemoglobin molecule for say a patient with myth hemoglobinemia or uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. What happens in these two? We'll just um, where is it? Where is it? Okay, if you see here, right, methemoglobinemia, methemoglobin acts the same at both. If you see this brown graph, na, it is intersecting the 660 line and the 940 line both at the same time. So, it's, its extension coefficient is same for both the red and the infrared spectrum. And its R to IR ratio is 1. So, no matter what actual oxygen oxyhemoglobin concentration is, because of the presence of the methemoglobin, the uh, console will always show an SpO2 of 85%, which is also faulty because oxyhemoglobin is even less. It is not even 85%. So, uh, our pulse oximeters are not exactly, um, you can say, equipped to deal with abnormal hemoglobin molecules. Another is carboxyhemoglobin. If you see carboxyhemoglobin, uh, right, uh, it overreads the SpO2. So, for each 1% of carbon monoxide, it overreads the saturation by 1%. So, again, we have no mechanisms to compensate for. Uh, abnormal hemoglobin molecules then venous pulsations uh, uh, as in severe tricuspid uh, uh, regurgitation even the venous uh, flow will be pulsatile so again going back to the ACDC uh, graph this was a DC component right this DC component is the non pulsatile part the non pulsatile venous capillary in the arterial blood so if, if the venous is also pulsatile every uh, regurgitation will contribute to the uh, pulsatile part the ac part as well we especially created this system so that only the arterial pulsation will be recorded as the ac component so uh, then obviously the reading for the for such kind of a circulation will be faulty because even the venous blood which has more deoxygenated hemoglobin will be contributing to the uh, AC component as well. So we cannot isolate the arterial hemoglobin, the arterial blood flow in such patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation and our pulse oximeters do not have any mechanisms to compensate for it. I am sorry. Okay. Then comes the IV dye. So in radiological procedures, if uh, IV uh, intravenous dyes are injected, again it's a pigment so that can alter our saturation reading. The very big disadvantage is that we cannot detect hyperventilation, hyper or hypo, both. We cannot understand anything about the ventilation of a patient. Now, what do I mean by that? This is a very small concept. You should uh, know this. Respiration has two components. One is the ventilation and other is the oxygenation. What we mean by ventilation is... To breathe in and breathe out air in air out that's ventilation here the action of diaphragm the rib cage the intercostal muscles all these come into play the accessory muscles as well oxygenation on the other hand is just the process of oxygen uptake into the blood from the alveoli to blood. Here the lung parenchyma and its integrity plays a role. So any patient who has fault in the ventilation will not be able to breathe in proper oxygen amount and breathe out the carbon dioxide produced. The major of proper ventilation is seen by CO2, the level of CO2 in the blood. If the patient has reduced partial pressure of CO2 which means that there is CO2 washout probably the patient is has high respiratory rate or is deep breathing and high has, has high tidal volume in both uh, 
the scenarios the minute ventilation is high and we call such a patient hyperventilating the patient's pco2 is increasing we understand that the co2 is not being washed out completely there is co2 retention and uh, uh, that means that the patient is hypoventilating and our pulse oximeter that measures spo2 has no mechanism whatsoever to tell us about the co2 status it is only telling us about the oxygenation right the oxygen uptake the part that went into uh, became pao2 and that became sao2 that part is what we are able to understand and we extrapolated to understand pao2 so saturation a pulse oximetry does not tell us about the ventilation status for this particular part i need an arterial blood gas sample which is invasive so this is one limitation other is it cannot detect hyperemia hyperemia or hyperoxia uh, in the beginning i told you with the oxygen dissociation curve that when uh, when the pao2 is 75 or more the sao2 will always be 100% right actually from 80 it's 100% from 75 it's 95 so more than 75 how much it is if i uh, say a patient is being given 100% fio2 uh for uh, the desaturation that the patient presented with now we ventilated the patient we gave antibiotics and we had done the therapy and now we think that the patient uh, should be weaned off because 100% oxygen is not ideal for a longer time so looking at the spo2 only showing uh, being shown as 100% is not a criteria because pao2 might be 200 might be 180 in such a patient or it could be just 88 it could be 94 92 right so we don't know more than 75 i have absolutely no idea so i cannot wean on the patient a lot of times uh, in certain institutes where uh, either the patient doesn't afford or there are uh, laboratory limitations we often take decisions based on spo2 which is not absolutely mm, recommended it, it's not a very good uh, as i told you it doesn't tell us about uh, the ventilation it doesn't tell us about hyperemia or hyperoxia so weaning the patient off based on 100% saturation is not ideal yes of course you can try to reduce and see if the patient is desaturating Uh, but it is not ideal it doesn't exactly tell us what is happening more than 75 of uh, partial pressure of oxygen tension so those are the limitations okay so this is uh, about pulse oximetry let's just uh, talk about some examples what all questions can be asked pulse oximetry is per se more of a theoretical topic Right, it can be asked in theory exam as a part of monitoring. Right, what all can be asked? One question is that pulse oximeter as a short note can come in its own, and when that comes, you have to explain all the headings that I have explained. Right, you have to give a definition or an introduction that it is a non-invasive uh, method of uh, asserting such uh, oxygen saturation. Then its principles where you have to explain about the Beer-Lambert's law, pathismography, and spectrophotometry, both of them. uh then uh, will be the equipment where you will tell about uh, you will mention about the probes and the sites and the console and what all console can tell you then uh, the applications and uses then comes advantages and then disadvantages or limitations right then you can talk about recent advances uh, where you can talk about perfusion index and the uh, uh, pulse variability the thermography variability index right so this this is if you have to write a short note or a long note per se in a long note to explain further but these are the headings that should be present if any of them is not present marks will be deducted and so these in themselves ha- are question principle of pulse oximetry is a small question then application and uses is another question advantages and disadvantages and limitation they are another question recent advances i am not sure if they will ask they haven't asked about perfusion index lately in any of the previous year's questions as i know about 
सो बट स्टिल यू शुड हैव सम आइडिया रिगार्डिंग वाइवा वोज आई डाउट दे विल आस्क टू मच अबाउट पल्स ऑक्सीमेट्री बट येस ऑफकोर्स दे कैन इफ दे हैव kept a monitor they have kept a pulse oximeter say a finger probe they can anyways ask for and if i if i am an examiner i will not go much in uh, principles uh, when i am taking a viva i will more be i will be interested more if the student knows more about the application and the uses and the dis, uh, limitations so this is about pulse oximetry from my side if you uh, have any further input to add or you have any queries or anything that you did not understand you want me to make another video on those topics uh, kindly uh, comment on them i'll appreciate your input and uh, please like my video if you did like it and i'll see you next time thank you